Hello and welcome to week two. This is a topic called mental illness and diversion or jail diversion. Uh, what you should have read or be reading uh, before these slides is the first two chapters of the textbook. Or you can go to the Journal of Offender Rehabilitation, look at the year 2007. You want to look for volume 45 and it will be in edition one to two. It will also be uh, the first of the two titles, uh, Mental Illness in Offender Population. And the second chapter or article is MIRE, M-I-R-E, Forsyth, Hansa. And the topic of this one is Jail Diversion, Addressing the Needs of Offenders with Mental Illness and Co-Occurring Disorders. So two readings, they are pretty short. Read the two readings and the PowerPoint slides you are now looking at. There'll be some follow-up questions at the end. Thanks. So based on the Murr article, uh, et al, et al just means there's more than usually three uh, authors, um, so you don't need to list them all. But according to Mir et al, their def definition of a jail diversion program are programs that are aimed at diverting individuals who are suffering from mental illnesses or a co-occurring -occur disorder. Uh, so that's a mental health disorder or a drug addiction disorder. And moving these people away from jails and prisons and into the community where they may, can, or, may or can get better with uh, community care. So the argument here is that yes, there's a lot of people who are dangerous and perhaps mentally ill and violent, and these people should be housed in jails and prisons. However, there are also a significant number of people with mental illnesses that should not be. These are not violent and not dangerous people. So what can we do in the middle area to keep these people who are in need of help away from jails and prison and direct them towards the help they need? So this is a uh, focus on jails first and foremost. A jail usually means the offender committed a misdemeanor. This involves incarceration for one year or less, whereas prisons involve a felony where the person is incarcerated for a year or more. So in this case, we are not talking about violent inmates who will serve long terms in prison. We're talking about people who have been incarcerated or at risk of incarceration, who are mentally ill and have committed a small crime. In other words, a misdemeanor. So in terms of Columbia, we may think about it in terms of uh, a paranoid schizophrenic who is having delusions and hallucinations. And they may be walking around five points and they walk into a liquor store and they cause a problem and the liquor store owner calls the police. When the police officer shows up, they could be arrested for disorderly conduct. Uh, let's say they shove or give the officer a little push. Now it's the discretion of the officer to arrest them for assault, for an assault of a police officer. But the officer has a lot of discretion in terms of what they can do with this person. Uh, does this person need to be in jail? Well, that is up to the discretion of the officer, but we know not all the time. So jail diversion programs give police officers the discretion to take these people to jail or to take them to a local health center where they can be diverted away from jail to get the care they need. Now you'll notice one other thing, that it says mental illness and co-occurring disorders. This may mean that the uh, person has a multiple has multiple mental illnesses, so sometimes mental illnesses kind of go together, or they may be mentally ill and also physically ill, they may have a physical condition, or a lot of times what is happening with mental, uh, mentally ill people, uh, particularly when they don't receive adequate health care, is they will cope with the symptoms of mental illness by the use of drugs and alcohol. Uh, a lot of uh, street drugs do the same thing as prescription drugs. So mentally ill people on the street will often use drugs and alcohol as a way to deal with symptoms. So even if this person is already on medications or not, uh, even if they are on medications, the alcohol and the street drugs can help alleviate these symptoms. It's something that not a lot of people think about. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see mentally ill people who are intoxicated 
at the time the police officer uh, interacts with them. And so we're talking about a very small subset of suspects or offenders that we do not necessarily want in a system, in a jail system, uh, because first and foremost, it's expensive to incarcerate people. And two, it may not actually be an appropriate way to treat these people in jails. Murr provides reference to another research study done by Hoff. Hoff and colleagues found that 75% or uh, three out of four of all offenders who are incarcerated with some sort of mental illness diagnosis also have drugs and alcohol abuse problems. Now the photo up here is some uh, college kid that's rather funny, but the reality of the situation is for people who are incarcerated, uh, drugs and alcohol becomes a chief way to dr deal with the symptoms of their mental health condition. If they are depressed, if they have anxiety or other symptoms, they may turn to drugs and alcohol. This doesn't mean it happens with every offender, but it seems to happen uh, quite frequently. Some people who are mentally ill may actually want to avoid certain drugs and alcohol because it could lead to more negative symptoms. So for example, uh, a schizophrenic who experiences anxiety or has visions or hearing or seeing things that are not there, they may smoke marijuana, but that may actually make it worse. It may lead to more symptoms. Whereas other uh, intoxicants such as drinking alcohol may actually reduce the symptoms. So uh, offenders, much like the general public who have mental illnesses, will often experiment with drugs and alcohol uh, to alleviate symptoms. Uh, it is important part of this class to realize that if offenders are mentally ill, uh, that the co-occurring conditions of drug and alcohol abuse uh, often emerges as part of that condition of mental illness. One other thing to think about from the Mir article involves three aspects of jail diversion programs that they suggest will increase success for offenders. The first one is that offenders should have some psychological testing to see how responsive they will be to treatment. If you run a simple test uh, and a simple uh, question answer test with offenders, they will usually uh, tell you the chances of success uh, pretty quickly. Uh, some offenders say, may simply not want uh, to be involved in a program. They may be quite happy uh, being living on the street, living in a tent, they just don't want to be incarcerated. But they also may not want some community health treatment. This happens in a minority of uh, cases. But if they do want treatment, you want to assess what the chances of success are and what is the appropriate or best type of treatment that they will need and expectations of how they will respond to that treatment, whether it's therapy, medication, hospitalization, or some sort of combination. For example, if it's a person who is drug addicted, who denies addiction to drugs, uh, you know that the chances of success will be much lower than somebody who has a drug problem that is open for change, accepts that they have a problem and uh, eager to start therapy or at least give it a chance. Number two, you have to find a very good match between the offender and the place or the services to where you're sending them. This makes sense. So we, for example, if we had a jail diversion uh, center in Five Points, we would have to make sure that it's ready to address the population in Five Points that needs this care. Uh, this could be homeless people, but of course Five Points also has a number of college students. So we'd have to include all different types of populations. Uh, if we were to start a center in Five Points, we couldn't say we only want female uh, offenders who are mentally ill and live on the street. That would mean that you can't accept male offenders. So there has to be communication between the police agencies, mental health agencies and community partners uh, in order to match the service to um, the offender needs or the needs of the community. Often what happens uh, is a police officer may arrest a suspect 
and uh, they may just hand them off to the criminal justice system so they go through jail to the courts uh, or they hand them to community uh, health and every time you reach a gap between the two agencies uh, there's a chance that the person can get left out or forgotten about or just simply fall through the, the gaps. This is uh, what we call a boundary spanner. So it helps if you have people who are employed that can work between two systems. For example, between a criminal justice system and social work, such as welfare, housing, and other needs, or criminal justice system and health, a person that can help facilitate access to mental health treatment, hospitalization, and other health outcomes. So what does that person uh, do in their job to link? Uh, it is important that these boundary uh, spanners um, are trained to work in different disciplines. And uh, this is particularly beneficial in things like drug court programs, where judges are trained in terms of the law as their judges, but they're also trained in particular aspects of drug addiction and mental illness. <coughs> Excuse me. In other cases, uh, this could also include basic conditions where the boundary spanner could look for things in welfare that we may not think about. One of the chief needs of um, offenders on the street is they are often in need of very basic things such as an ID card, a bus pass, basic med medications. And this is where that person can help. They can also help in achieving things like Medicare or Medicaid benefits. And um, if they've lost a driver's license, they can help locate it or help them file for a new one. These are basic things that uh, us living in middle class society don't think about, um, but often people who are mentally ill and living on the street have difficulty in negotiating the system and um, can get a lot of help in terms of uh, linking the systems. So in terms of actual application, South Carolina has no uh, jail diversion programs at all none in any part of the state. And this is surprising as these uh, diversion programs have been going for 20 to 30 years. So one example which I'm familiar with happened in Orlando, Orange County, Orlando, which is a very large county. Uh, and here I did a lot of work and they have a very large scale diversion program that we can learn from. This is where a lot of information comes from, but it's something for you to think about in terms of this court this course and for future uh, applications if you go into the workforce as these are very good programs that uh, hopefully one day will come to South Carolina. So what did they do in Orange County? The first thing they did was uh, developed uh, an assessment to figure out a very complicated system where uh, people with mental illness and co-occurring conditions uh, would kind of filter all through the criminal justice and health system. So I developed a map to help uh, everyone figure out uh, the system and where people move through the system. Uh, the, the goal was to develop, to, to develop a one-stop shop. This is a place where people with all different needs but with those mental health conditions and at risk for entering the criminal justice system could filter through a single point of entry rather than jumping around here or there for benefits. Uh, the system being very sporadic and having them jump around is very inefficient. Orange County, as I mentioned, is a very large county. It extends about two hours drive in every direction from Orlando and has a very large population. Uh, in that county, there are a lot of homeless people and or mentally ill people who experience homelessness, drug addiction, and they often have to transport themselves either walking or via bus all over town to try and find different services when they need them. When they don't, it often led to a lack of medication, a reduced access to health care, and naturally a higher chance of them becoming incarcerated or going to jail. So a single point of entry, according to this definition we have on this slide, talks about a centralized intake and referral system. Here it prioritizes access to services based on needs. So thinking about that again, the offender has certain needs, mental health needs, 
it could be medication and these things could be placing this individual at risk um, of having negative health outcomes uh, even potentially becoming uh, psychotic or having a break from reality the needs are very diverse um, but it can lead to crisis uh, so in this case um, in a south carolina context a jail diversion program uh, would similarly try to find single points of access rather than have uh, this population uh, moving all around town trying to find mental health and physical health needs at a hospital here or a uh, halfway house there uh, these things kind of work in one central location in south carolina some obvious uh, cities would be columbia greenville and charleston uh, these all have large uh, populations of mentally ill people who consistently deal with police and may be better served through one of these centers once again police have full discretion on deciding whether to take uh, an individual to jail or to one of these centers um, so they can still take them to jail and this is an important uh, thing to consider So in the example, uh, this is where things got complicated. Uh, this is Orlando, uh, Florida, once again, Orange County. So the individual is at the top of the page, and this is a person with a mental health problem and perhaps a su substance abuse problem, and they wanted to get services. In the past, what they would do, uh, they would often, starting from the left, uh, deal with police and perhaps be put uh, into jail and then go into the court system uh, this often uh, caused was was prompted by police responding to a disruption uh, such as littering loit loitering having an argument drinking in, in public and a very common one was um, homeless people urinating in public and getting uh, a misdemeanor charge for exposure this is when they would interact with the police um, they obviously didn't have a bathroom to go to so it was a charge that police could use um, to place people in jail uh, at this point you can see the the pathway from jail to courts so they are in the criminal justice system they're getting services in the system uh, expensive services and maybe not appropriate uh, there's other times uh, the person would um, go to certain uh, health care needs, which you see on the right, which is Lakeside or Lakeside Alternatives and the Center for Drug Free Living. So these are halfway houses and community centers that provide health care. So rather than go to uh, the in, in the criminal justice system, the individual may take a bus or walk and find uh, a way to go there and all of the arrows in the middle um, include other options for the individual such as going to the emergency room in a hospital or the central receiving center which is a health care slash physical care center and moving back and forth you can see the crazy arrows underneath all of the bubbles show that once in one of these systems the person could bounce back and forth repeatedly into each one of these uh, areas the local term for this and the, col the colloquial term is called bus therapy b-u-s uh, because the person is simply bussing themselves around or riding a bus or these organizations are simply moving them from one place to another so for example uh, an emergency room may bus the person to the center for drug-free living uh, the person uh, may not do well with therapy the police may then take them to jail to court so they're simply uh, not getting care they're just bouncing back and forth uh, between each of these systems the other problem is each of these systems focus on one thing jails and courts is the criminal justice system the center for drug-free living is a mental health system the emergency room is a physical health system so a person with co-occurring conditions such as a mental health problem a physical health problem and a drug addiction uh, is, uh, is not getting generalized care for all of those things at the same time they're simply getting uh, one thing taken care of at one time uh, there's also additional problems uh, that mentally ill people living on the street may have uh, other issues such as poor hygiene 
poor social skills. And so uh, they're not always equipped in each of these places to deal with that. For example, uh, a jail has a shower in which a person can get uh, uh, a, sh a shower, they can shave, they can have a change of clothes into jail clothes, uh, but an emergency room may not have that facility. Uh, so once again, it's treating one part of a complicated problem in a person and uh, th the chances are the person will bounce around, uh, get the services perhaps willy-nilly, but not in any sort of comprehensive manner. So in the second example, uh, the goal was to create the Central Receiving Center, or CRC. As you can see, this stands above the other systems. Uh, the jail diversion can still take place, uh, but the officer has the option to take uh, a misdemeanor, mentally ill and or substance abusing um, offender to the Central Receiving Center. This is a one-stop shop. Here, uh, the individual can get medication, food, clothing. If the person remains perhaps belligerent or even violent, uh, uh, the police can still take them to the jail. Uh, there's a standard of safety uh, because while they're not a jail, they, the central receiving center does have security. It also has a cell, uh, what you would call a padded cell, which is a a, a room with soft walls if a person is, um, wants, is, is exhibiting suicidal behaviors or self-injurious behaviors. And they're also located near the emergency room uh, should the individual need detox services or medication or other physical health services. <clears throat> they can also serve as a referral system to Lakeside um, Alternatives or the Center for Drug-Free Living and at this point, um, the focus is on things like housing and more long-term placement back in the community. The central receiving center can operate on services there, but as you see, they have every option for referral uh, from the criminal justice system to a physical health system, to a mental health system, and to a welfare system. The CRC itself, has on staff 24 hours a day a psychiatrist, uh, psychologists, graduate students who are working their way through masters and PhD in psychology. It has security personnel and it also has social workers. So while it sounds highly staffed, remember it is a one-stop shop that can focus on complicated co-occurring conditions all at one time and at the bottom of this pathway, you'll see the ultimate goal is to provide the services that are needed to produce the best outcomes. So what we have here is a repeat of the definition of a jail diversion program. The goal is to divert a minor or misdemeanor, that's a misdemeanor, offenders who have a mental illness and or substance abuse disorder from the criminal justice system and towards a mental health system. What we're trying to do uh, is move them away from the criminal justice system because one, it is not uh, usually appropriate in a lot of cases, and two, the criminal justice system is expensive. It is expensive to book someone into the system uh, to track them and staffing and all of the other aspects of the criminal justice system. There are three aspects of a jail diversion program or three different ways to think about it. Uh, one is a crisis intervention team. One is called a pre-booking jail diversion and one is a post-booking. We will now look at the differences. Crisis intervention teams uh, originated in policing. So this is an actual team that goes into the community to deal with mentally ill offenders. Uh, one of the original models started in Memphis, so you'll hear a lot about the Memphis CIT or Crisis Intervention Team model. It's because it started in the city of Memphis and the police were at the forefront of this approach and have since developed the program in other police departments across the country. 
this started in 1988, so it's been around for a, a long time. And it started with uh, bad uh, interactions between police who were not very well trained and their interactions with mentally ill suspects. Uh, the majority of police that would go in uh, would use a physical response perhaps before they needed to. And if there was resistance, uh, they would get into uh, interactions that would lead to harm for the suspects and harm for the officers. So for example, if you go in and there is a, a person who is having a schizophrenic breakdown uh, and you corner them and you don't use dialogue and you go in with physical strength, that person can react uh, very violently and it can lead up to the point of death for the suspect and maybe even the officer. In Oregon, there was a recent situation uh, with a mentally ill person who uh, this individual was having a schizophrenic event. And he was approached by three police officers in Portland. His name was James Chase, C-H-A-S-S-E. And he was repeatedly tased by the three officers. And he ended up getting 16 broken ribs, a broken shoulder, a sternum injury and internal injuries. He was refused uh, access to the jail when he was brought in and he eventually and he quickly died from a result of these injuries. In response, Portland, Oregon started their own CIT or crisis intervention team. Uh, so that's been a common uh, aspect of crisis intervention teams, which is negative outcomes or something terrible happens with an interaction with a mentally ill suspect. Uh, the suspect is killed and or the police officer is killed and they'll um, implement a CIT model program uh, adapted, adopted from another uh, jurisdiction like Memphis. In some cases, uh, they will be uh, preventative and adopt the program beforehand. So we have a solution uh, and this is um, the CIT model. In the CIT model, police officers uh, those who graduate will receive 40 hours of training. Now the goal, because this is expensive training, the goal is not to train every single officer. You don't need that. You need to train about 20% of your officers and uh, those officers are graduates of the training. So the goal is if there is an event where officers respond to an event with a mentally ill suspect, and uh, they can talk to the suspect, you could get one of these trained officers on the scene within five to 10 minutes of a response call. These specialist officers um, can respond quickly and use their training in order to communicate with the suspect and also with more education of if the person is responding to symptoms of mental illness and where's the best place to take them. As a result of these trainings, officer injuries have decreased by about seven times what they previously were. The next thing we want to talk about is pre-booking diversion programs. So this is what police do before the offender is booked or goes into jail and court, much like in the Orange County example we talked about before. It's in contrast to post-booking. So in this case, the person who the police are dealing with on the street do not actually enter the criminal justice system. They are diverted away from uh, jail or arrest. This avoids a large amount of staff time, paperwork, and um, can divert people away from an expensive option for the criminal justice system. Uh, once again, in South Carolina, this is not possible if there is no pre-booking diversion program in place. If arrest is the only option for officers, they do not have the discretion to take someone to a pre-booking diversion program. Therefore, they are forced to arrest people when even the officers may not think that this is the best uh, approach. How do pre-booking jail diversion programs look? So if we were to establish one in say Columbia, what would it look like? Well, there's about six categories that you can see on the left column um, that you need to justify in order to have a fully fledged efficient program. 
this is often in a big binder with the curriculum, with a specialized training group that come into the police department. And it moves down from uh, quality training, which as mentioned, involves about 40 hours of specific training. Uh, having about 15 to 20% of your officers trained uh, so that response times can be in the five to 10 minute response time to get these specialist officers on the scene. As a side note, these, these specialist officers are maybe tr paid a little bit more money because they have done the training and they will be maybe called more frequently. It, uh, the next category is police decision making. So uh, when the police, the specialized police officer comes on the scene, um, they are, they are familiar with the jail diversion center and they need their time freed up to get back on the street to, uh, you know, to continue policing. Um, so this focuses on police given discretion in the decision and also uh, expedited procedure when they drop the suspect off at the receiving center at the jail diversion center. Uh, system integration is crucial. Uh, that means that you have to train uh, the people at the police agency in the communications department. Obviously, dispatch and 911 has to be integrated. And another component of pre booking diversion programs involves data collection. Uh, these programs may have a feel good, but we want to make sure that they actually are making measurable and beneficial outcomes that we can actually evaluate these programs and document what changes, if any positive changes are occurring and how we can measure this. So some of the ways that we typically measure this is through event forms where um, police will uh, respond to how many events they're responding to. We can measure the outcomes related to that. Officer satisfaction forms. So once these programs are up and running, you can survey police officers and find out what's working and what's not working and make adjustments. And also we can do a sample of offenders and find out uh, what type of satisfaction or problems there are by talking to offenders, whether they go to jail or whether they go to a receiving center in the pre-booking stage, we can do follow-up. A final component is that uh, leadership is crucial. Um, this involves changing police culture as being purely responsive and having lower degrees of education with regard to mental illness and also providing a financial incentive for leadership for the select officers to dedicate that time for their training and also committing to being involved in these interactions when called on the street. The final component, number three, is post booking. So in this case, uh, the person is in fact booked into the criminal justice system. Uh, they are somehow processed into the criminal justice system, but then they are diverted after that point. So for example, a person in Colombia who is mentally ill and uh, drug addicted may get picked up, may push a police officer, uh, still under a misdemeanor charge maybe for drunk in public, urinating in public. Uh, the police officer in this case decides to take them to jail. They are not taking them to the jail diversion center, which once again is a pre-booking. So what happens after this point that they are processed in the system? Uh, there's two main post-booking programs. One is a jail screening, one is a court screening. Uh, in the jail screening, if this is something that's operating in a system in the first uh, eight hours, if they have such a system in place, specialized staff will conduct a screening on mental health status and or uh, drug and alcohol abuse. If the person is diverted out of the system and into a health system, that charge that they were booked for does not stay on their record. It is completely removed from the record. In the second case, it could be a court screening. So now we're thinking about mental health courts and drug courts. Uh, following a, d a detailed evaluation, usually in the first 24 to 48 hours, um, this is often conducted by a social worker or a, psycho a psychologist that will discuss their case. 
that person may recommend a diversion and they will appear in a mental health court or a uh, drug court and the judge will divert them towards some sort of care in the community. Once again, the misdemeanor charge is removed from the person's record. Uh, however, if they violate by acting violent or uh, causing problems in those community settings, they can be taken back to jail. Uh, one interesting part for criminal justice students is that this court screening that occurs is done by a, a psychologist or a social worker. Um, the word forensic is often used incorrectly. Forensic just simply means someone who works in the court system. So a forensic social worker or a forensic psychologist who does these reports is simply a social worker or a psychologist that works in the court system to do an evaluation. This could be a basic evaluation on a screening tool with questions and answers. Um, it is not what the media thinks, which is uh, a forensic psychologist that gets into the mind of serial killers. So for post booking jail programs, the police um, may uh, arrest someone who's a misdemeanor offender. The intake process happens at jail. The mentally ill person is uh, placed in a special part of the jail. And then following screening by that forensic uh, uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, or even by specialized staff in the correctional officer unit, they are then detoured out of the criminal justice system and into more appropriate mental health facilities where they could receive medication, housing, uh, or other services that they need. In the court process, uh, the mental health, in, the inmate with a mental health inmate uh, will often require an advocate. Um, this is the person, as mentioned before, a boundary spanner that intersect uh, jails, courts, uh, and social and mental health uh, welfare types of um, environments in the community. They intersect all of those different groups. There is a number of situations in which mentally uh, people with a mental illness cannot truly advocate for themselves. They may have difficulties communicating exactly what their needs are. Uh, in some cases, they may have a, a psychotic event or in the case of uh, bipolar disorder, they may be undergoing a manic event or a depression event. Uh, and so this person often requires someone with training that can advocate for the, for the individual with mental illness as they're in a very vulnerable stage uh, during this diversion process. Where they are diverted to can largely depend on their um, symptoms. Uh, you can see here that there's a, a loose list of some examples, and a lot of it depends on the behavior uh, exhibited by the person. If there's a immediate physical illness or issues, a hospital or a medical facility, uh, if the person is undergoing some sort of severe um, breakdown psych psychotic event, uh, if they uh, exhibit suicidal behaviors, um, then the person can be placed in what they call a suicide resistant gown where they can't harm themselves. The shoes and shoelaces and other things will be taken away from them uh, and they'll be observed in a special unit until um, those impulses pass. Uh, if it's drug and alcohol, they may require detox. You've probably heard the term the DTs, and this is when someone's hands are shaking and they're going through physical withdrawals of opioid addiction or alcoholism, and they often require supervision. Uh, they may require some medications as they um, detox from drugs and alcohol. And this is obviously a very different um, process as where they compared to whether they could be in jail, where they may be going through the DTs without any sort of medications and maybe vomiting and having some pretty severe physical responses in a jail cell that could actually uh, lead to death. If the individual displays violence, um, then there's an on-duty officer that can be taken to the jail at that point in time. Uh, often violence is a symptom of mental health, and so that's why having specialized mental health staff can also be good. Uh, 
if it's an issue of homelessness, you can think about things like short term housing, um, bus passes, um, temporary housing and other um, aspects, even connecting them to family members that they've lost contact with who may not be able to get in touch with them and ways to connect them to services. Uh, there's also a need for chronic persistent mental illness. Uh, this is often individuals who repeatedly cycle into the criminal justice system, um, what they'll call high flyers. This is a person that staff will constantly see, they'll know them by name. So perhaps more long-term care, case management, long-term supervision, uh, more uh, long-term strategies are, are beneficial for this group. So for a centralized receiving center or a diversion process, uh, we mentioned a lot of these issues. Um, one important aspect of this can also be assertive community treatment, ACT. Uh, this is what deinstitutionalization was supposed to uh, deal with in the 1960s and 70s when inmates, uh, sorry, not inmates, but individuals in mental health hospitals or asylums as they were called there, um, it was seen as uh, unethical and too expensive. So the asylums were closed and individuals were moved back into uh, community environments. Uh, the movie, the old movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is an example of uh, some criticisms of asylums. One of the unattended consequences was rather than move back into the community, a lot of these individuals with mental health problems actually ended up in our jails and prisons. And our jails and prisons became a default mental health system. There are still some uh, community treatments that are in place. So receiving centers can also move people into these um, environments. The definition of these uh, ACTs or assertive community treatment centers, uh, these are called hospitals without walls because the person may have confinements. Each state is a little bit different for how long you can confine someone against their will. But this usually focuses on intensive mental health treatment for individuals who are high flyers or high risk of having some sort of psychiatric uh, break or psychiatric need for hospitalization. Another issue with specialized court is that um, this is a way to deal with uh, individuals who uh, are experiencing drug addiction and or mental health. Uh, the judges in this case um, receive um, specialized training so do the prosecutors and the lawyers involved. In not all of these cases, is there an automatic diversion away from jail? But often there is an increased sensitivity or training, so decisions can be tailored more towards providing the appropriate levels of care. So some drug courts may serve as post-booking uh, diversion programs, others do not. But even in the cases where they do not, um, there's a, in, in a more of a focus on the role of addiction and the need for treatment as opposed to a traditional criminal justice response that is expensive and inappropriate. So in summary, uh, in individuals who uh, experience the symptoms of mental illness and or substance abuse are a very vulnerable population. They are expensive to treat, and in some cases, the treatment is hard to do and they may be non compliant. Uh, this is particularly high in disorders such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, where the individual may feel, uh, may not like the, the side effects of the medication. And once they start to feel better, uh, either through a manic event in bipolar disorder or, or through uh, just feeling better in schizophrenia, being on medication, they'll often stop the medication and then the symptoms will come right back or come back even stronger. So it's a complicated and difficult uh, problem to deal with. It's also a very expensive problem, but it is also one that can be uh, avoidable. Even in tough economies, the integration of the services is a smart economic uh, way to go about uh, addressing this population in our society. Uh, it can maximize uh, the outcomes uh, from 
everything from avoiding the criminal justice system where it's inappropriate to providing services such as mental health care, jobs, homes, relationships. These are uh, outcomes that uh, minimise uh, recidivism, which is returning to jail or prison, uh, minimise victimisation, including victimisation of oneself if people hurt themselves, and uh, it focuses on one very specific population. This is very important because uh, a, a response of some people is that, oh, you're, you're giving people a free pass. But once again, it is non-violent offenders only who have been or can be arrested for misdemeanor offenses due to drug charges and or having the symptoms of mental illness. Thank you for listening. Uh, now take a look at module two in Blackboard, uh, read through module two and um, complete your answers. Thank you.